Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to Let's Study the Word. I'm your host, Minister Dr. Karen Powell, and I know tonight we have a word from the Lord. So one more time, we go into the word to get a word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, most high God, you're the one who was, who is, and is to come, and there's none like unto you. You're the great high priest. And Father, as we come before you this evening, mighty God, we come with our cups lifted up. We come with a spirit of expectancy, mighty God, knowing that you are the author and the finisher of our faith, knowing you can do abundantly more than we can ask or imagine, knowing that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, and that you have come to bring light and to give us word. Thank you, mighty God, for the download of your anointing. Thank you, God, for the download of your word, which make us rich, which make us, mighty God, gain wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Thank you, God, that you're with us and in us and working through us. We put ourselves on the altar of sacrifice, mighty God. And Lord, we pray that you find us holy and acceptable. Take full control now of our Father. In everything, we give you thanks and put you first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Good evening. I know you had many options. And if you're in Portmore with the rain falling, you may want to go curl up in bed. So the very fact that you took time out to spend an hour with me while we go into the word, seeking a revelation from God, I am so grateful. And tonight I know God is not going to disappoint. And so we go to the word of God. And we're going to the Old Testament tonight, and we'll be going all over. But the main text tonight is taken from the book of Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. And if you've never used your Bible, at least you know that it's the first book in the Bible. So you should find it pretty easy. Genesis chapter 26. I do hope you have your pens, your notebooks, your Bibles ready, whether you have them on computers, laptops, phones, whatever it is. We don't care. We just want to go into the word. I want you to see the word for yourself. I don't want you to just listen. I want you to participate by reading with me as we read along. So Genesis chapter 26, we'll be reading verses 1 to 5 and then verses 12 to 13. And if I was in church, I would say, say amen when you found it. But since we're on Zoom, <laughs> we'll just go ahead and read. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. So what it's saying is that, yes, there was a famine during the days of Abraham, but now there's a second famine in the land. And Isaac, so now we know we're talking about the season of Isaac. Isaac went up unto Abilamech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee, and unto thy seed, I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swore unto thy Abraham, thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of the heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Move down to verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year and hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. I want to read that again, just in case somebody missed that. Then Isaac sowed in that land, in the land of famine, and received in the same year during a famine, and hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward, not backwards, not standing still, he went forward and grew until he became very great. We'll stop there for the reading of God's holy word. I love that scripture. I love that scripture because I think that scripture perfectly speaks to the topic 
for tonight. It's time for the artist. It's time for the harvest. So for the last three weeks, we have been examining this whole concept of seed and coming to understand that seed means potential. We examine the fact that a seed provides one meal if it's eaten. If you eat a ear of corn, the corn is dead, that's it, goes into your stomach and it adds no further value. But then we also discuss the point that if you sow that ear of corn, then it will yield many fold. And so this we discussed was the process of multiplicity, where God will take one and yield a multiplying factor, giving many folds, hundred folds. This led us to the idea that if a seed is eaten, if a seed is unused, if a person represents a seed, if we are seeds in the land and we just stay in our dormant position, then we die full of potential that could have been offered to the world. We could have multiplied ourselves, but we decided to remain dormant. It was a choice we made. And that was one of the week's messages. I think that was like three weeks ago when we talked about choices. We have the choice to remain dormant or the choice to explode. Some of us get baptized and saved and we go into church and we sit in one seat and we never speak about God to anybody else. It's dormant. We never share about the love of God. We've never, we've never even sent a message to someone to say, this is a Zoom service, join us. Sometimes you don't even need to speak. Sometimes you just send it. Who wants to hear? Let him hear. Some of us are so dormant that we don't even speak about God in our own families. And when we die, in such a sad state, because in us was the potential to multiply that much more. In us was the pot potential to do great things, to do great works for God. Some of us eat our seed. So sometimes we're the seed and sometimes we have a seed. And some of us eat our seeds. We, we get the salary and we eat it up. And then we can't understand why we can't make it to the next payday and why things are so dark and dim. It's because we ate the potential of what we had that could have become great. We didn't give the potential to God. We, we never paid a tithe. We never paid an offering. We, we've never given God a first fruit. We've never even said thanks by giving something back unto God. So that led us to the point of germination. For those of us who will say, Lord, use me. Lord, use my seed. Lord, use my gift. Lord, use my talent. All of these things are seed. Lord, use my emotions. Seeds. So we can be a seed, carrying a seed, showing a seed, living a seed life. Isn't it amazing? Because seed is just an image of what we want it to represent in that moment. A seed is food. A seed is potential. A seed is possibility. A seed represents life and it represents death because a seed that is buried, hidden beneath the soil, it looks like it's dead. But we discussed that the seed buried on the ground, maybe jeered by those around who don't understand the process. But that seed will pull water to itself. And if you're the seed, then you're pulling the word of God into yourself. Somebody will say, you could have used your time better. You look at one whole hour. You only have 24 hours in the day. Why didn't you just go and get a massage this hour or watch some TV this hour? But you saw the importance as a seed of God to pull water, the word into yourself and spend this hour with me. And as you drink, as you full of yourself, the word of the living God, it allows you to break out of your coat, becoming a new creation. People looking at you and say, you don't look like how you used to look. You don't sound like how you used to sound. You don't act like how you used to act. And some people may even think that they don't want to be around you anymore because you're not the fun girl anymore. And we spoke about this message being breakout. 
breaking out of our financial desert, breaking out of our old lifestyle, breaking out of seasons, breaking out of things that would have our families and cycles that would have our families under bondage. And we suggested that breakout comes when you feed yourself the water or the word of God. And what happens is that water, that word of God breaks the coat that contains you and expands you. Is it any wonder when Jesus was talking about old wineskins and new wine, he said you can't put new wine in old wineskin because you expect to have the wine expand and old wineskins would crack. So as a new believer, as an old believer, as a mature believer, we must continually be drawing water into our system and out of our bellies will now flow rivers of living water. And we spoke about the fact that as you're putting down roots and pulling into you and anchoring yourself, you're also pushing up to heaven and seeing the face of God, seeing the light, being you know, drawn to the light. We spoke about this new life, this new potential, this new plant, this new offering. And then we looked at seeds now, not just being us, but then we looked at our money. You know, that thing that we don't like to talk about. <laughs> we looked at our money being a seed. A seed given to us. We, we've got to understand that what we work, what we earn, it's not ours. We didn't do it of our own selves. You know, we got God's back it in when we work. It's He who gave us health and strength. It's He who gave us the ability to think through some solutions and some suggestions that you needed on the job to succeed. And so it was God's back it in that allowed you to move and be promoted into the job. And so what you earn really belongs to God. And we compared that to the Garden of Eden and we said, all of it belongs to God. And God says, out of that, give me a, a portion. Give me that first portion. Give me that tithe. And then we spoke about this whole idea of first fruits, which is a new beginning offering. It, it's not your tithe, it's a special offering, a special seed that we're giving to God to say, Lord, this seed, we wanted to do something for this year. And some of the things we spoke about is that the seed should draw God's attention to make a covenant and the seed should create a multiplication effect in our lives and the seed should provide a shield and give us an exceeding great reward. And I'm not going to preach it back over. If you missed it, go back to the YouTube channel, go back to the Facebook page. That message is called, let the seed speak. So go back and watch it. But tonight, after going through all of that, after talking about seeds being, being a, a possibility, a potential for God to work with, giving God something. As I saw God's face, I wanted to know, where do I go from here? And God says, well, you can't talk about the seed if you don't talk about the harvest. <laughs> you see, if you give God something to use, he's going to use it and use it well. Remember when the prophet said to the woman who came to him and said, you know, you're my, my, yes, son, your, your prophet, my husband is dead. And the, and the debtors are coming to collect everything and they're coming to take my sons as hostage because I got nothing to pay them. But he was your servant, so what are you going to do about it, prophet? And the prophet says, what do you have in your house? And she says, the only thing I've got is a little oil. Well, that was her seed. And if you have a seed, God will use it. So the prophet said to her, woman, go borrow some vessels. And she borrowed the vessels in the middle of her drought, in the middle of her dry season, in the middle of her emptiness. Some people must have thought that she was a mad woman. Why is she borrowing all these vessels, these pots, these barrels? Everybody knows she's broke because let's face fact, everybody always knows your business. They know it sometimes better than how you know it. Why is she borrowing more? Why is she putting herself in more debt? But this woman heard a word from God. The prophet was a representation of God on the earth and the woman heard a word. And when she heard the word, she determined in herself that 
if a word is spoken, I'm going to do what the word tells me to do. Likewise, in the scripture we just read, we see something strange going on. It's a strange situation that the man of God finds himself in. Isaac is in a town in a land where there is a famine. Here it is, we're talking about new beginnings, we're talking about a new year, we're talking about breaking out, we're talking about let the seed speak. But when we look around us, there's a problem. There is COVID, there is American, there is economic situation and upheaval. Crime is running rampant. If you're living in Jamaica, you're wondering what is going on? Is our country gone mad? We've never seen it like this before. And everything tells us that what we are talking about is crazy. How can we sow a seed at this time? At this time, when we hear that chicken prices is going up, at this time, when we know for a fact that our salaries, if they even get an increase, is not going to move by much. At this time, when, when you're trying to figure out how do you survive, how do you keep your children safe, how do you keep your son safe, how do you keep them under the word, how do you keep them locked into God, here it is, a woman of God is coming to tell you to sow. And it sounds good and it sounds nice, but what if I don't have what to sow? I hear some of you saying, why should I sow? What am I going to get for this sowing? And I repeat a story that was told last week where Jesus and his disciples are in the temple and they're observing what was happening around them. And there were some rich men of God they were called Pharisees and Sadducees who came into the temple and some other rich guys. And when it was time for their offering, they put in big money. They sold big money. Because they knew what the scripture says. Because the scripture says, what you sow is what you reap. So they sold. But there was a little woman who had a little mite a fraction, a mini fraction of what these big guys had. But this woman sowed something special. She sowed her faith. How do I know she sowed her faith? Because she gave all she had. Jesus said she had given all she had. And if Jesus said it, that settles it. Because he knows everybody's financial situation. He knows our circumstances. And he said she has given more than all the rich guys had put in the tithing bucket. This woman we identified must have been in tune with God. Her circumstances may have said, are you crazy? Why are you giving all you have? In fact, it reminds us when the prophet went down into the land and there was a famine going on and there was a woman who had one little meal left and she thought to herself, let me go by the city gates. And when she went by the city gates, men would normally sit on the gates, would have seen her in her circumstances. And as men of God, they would have done something to help the widow. But when she went to the city gates, it was all locked up because there was a famine in the land and nobody had anything. So she thought to herself, let me gather a few sticks and let me go and prepare this last meal and after which my son and I will die. She had no expectation other than death. And then comes this prophet, this man of God, this word who says to her, give me first. Sow a seed in me and watch what will happen. It's time for a harvest. 
first thing I want to talk about tonight as we look at the scripture in Genesis chapter 26 is the circumstances that Isaac found himself in. It was a famine. But as much as there was a famine of a physical nature, there wasn't a famine of a spiritual nature. Think about it. The Bible says in verse one, there was a famine in the land. And it identified that this famine was not the one of Abraham, but one that was occurring during the time of Isaac. But then when we go down to verse two, the word of God says, the Lord appeared unto Isaac and said to him, can I challenge us for the first point this evening is that when you sow, so with a level of expectancy because you're doing it on the God's word. You are acting on God's word. As you're sowing, you're sowing according to the word of God. You're moving according to God's timing. It's important that we understand this because in this verse, it says the Lord appeared. Now today we may not see the Lord appearing in physical form. We may not even have an angel appearing, but John 10, 27 tells us my sheep know my voice. So sometimes in the recesses of your being, in the recesses of your heart, and next week we're going to be looking at spirit, body, and soul. We're going to be looking at what makes up man, what ties us to God. And when we look at the recesses of our heart, that connection we have with God, our spirit man deep cries on to deep. Our spirit man links to the spirit of God. What does the Bible tell us about the spirit? It says that only way we can worship God is we worship him in spirit and in truth. Why? Because God is spirit. And so as we worship in spirit, as we come to know God, as we build a relationship with God, we hear the voice of God, which tells us what is the right timing. The voice of God will tell you when the time is right. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 2 tells us there's a time to mourn and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. So there are seasons. In fact, when God created the heavens and the earth, he says that he created the sun and the moon to govern the times and the seasons. But outside of that, I want to tell you that you have a God who is not limited by those times and seasons. We are, but in the spirit realm, God is not limited. So when he speaks and says it is time, it is time. Sarah was 90 years old when God spoke to her womb. Elizabeth, the mother of John, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, was advanced with age, but God too opened her womb. Mary was a virgin, and so no seed or semen had ever touched the seed of her womb. But when God says it's time to fertilize, it fertilized because God is the master of all the things that he has created. And when he decrees a thing, it is done. Remember when God says to Moses, go speak to the rock and tell it to give forth water, a rock? Why didn't he say dig a hole and let there be a well and water comes gushing up out of the well? No, God wants to show that he is the master of all things. And so if he speaks to us and tells us to do something, it does not matter what your circumstances look like. It does not matter how old you look. It does not matter how gray your hair may be. It does not matter how empty your bank account may seem. It does not matter whether there is a COVID or a plague. When God says, get ready, get ready. It's time to move. So the first point we're making tonight is listen to the voice of God. It does not sound logical, but let me tell you, if you act on what he says, logics will be torn away. Somebody sent me a message and said, how much must I 
you know, pay for first fruits? What percentage? Don't listen to me. Listen to the voice of God. He will tell you. And if he says to like the widow, you know, give all. It's hard and it sounds illogical. But do as he says. If he impresses upon you like Abraham, give a tent to Melchizedek. Do as you see fit. If he comes to you and he says something to you that impresses your spirit so much that like Sam Solomon, you want to just be extravagant and you just start throwing out the harvest. You just start throwing out the sacrificial offering. You just start giving everything, just going wild and illogical. Let me tell you, God's reward will just be as crazy and to the world would seem just as illogical. I, let, let me tell you, I love the logical. I love things that makes absolutely no sense. Because the Bible tells me that God will take the, you know, the simple things and confound the wise. Some years ago, I remember I was doing a study on tongues, speaking in tongues. And for those of you who don't speak in tongues, believe me, it is an amazing experience. And it's something that you should covet. It's something that you should earnestly desire. It's something that you should cry out to God and ask him to give to you. And in looking at the, the, the material I was studying, I saw where some persons were saying, you know, tongues are not for today. Tongues are for the early church. Because when they read in Acts, when the people came out of the upper room and they were speaking in tongues, all the persons around were hearing their own languages being spoken. So they were saying, we call it tongues, but it was really persons speaking in the languages of the other nations that they weren't used to. So here it was, these Jews were speaking Egyptians and Africans and, 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 and all the other languages because where they were was the center of the marketplace. Where they were was the center of where everybody was coming from to trade. So they said, tongues is not for today. It's not for the current church. And when they hear people speaking in tongues, they say, it is Babel, it makes no sense. And I remember when I was doing the research, I saw something that blew my mind. And I said, I don't understand how people who are so knowledgeable about the scriptures never saw the scripture. Because in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 to 6, it tells us, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue or in tongues does not speak to people, but to God. Underline this now. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the spirit. Draw breaks. So it means that at some point in the New Testament church, as people spoke in tongues, it sounded just like how we sound now when we speak in tongues. It sounds like Babel. It sounds like they're not understanding. That's why the, the, the apostle had to guard and guide them when he comes, he goes down in verse five of that same scripture, first Corinthians chapter 14. And he says, you know, listen, I would earnestly desire every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. For if you prophesy, it is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what is was said in tongues so that the church may be edified. So it means that there was a point in time in the New Testament church where they were speaking in tongues and people didn't understand what was being said unless somebody, just like today, interpreted it. So therefore, speaking in tongues is a real thing. Don't let anybody take away it from you because what speaking in tongues does is that it brings you revelation and the knowledge and instructions. I, doesn't, I don't say, that's what verse six tells you. So Romans 8, 26 picks up that story, that part and says, we know not we should speak, pray for, but the spirit itself make an intercession with us 
for groanings which cannot be uttered. That's what speaking in tongues is all about. It's a groaning, talking on the inside to God about your circumstances and your situation. It's not logical. And as we saw in this season of COVID and Omicron and crime and all the other things going around us, it is not logical, but it makes a connection to God. It pulls us closer by the Spirit to God. It gives us an opportunity to hear the voice of God and the nudging of God to tell us when is it time to sow. Because God has some strange times to sow, as we saw right here in Genesis 26. God says, dig the field. There is no water, God. I know, plow the field. But God, there is no water in the, in, in the, in the cisterns. I know, Isaac, plow the field. But God, people are going to think me crazy. I know, plow the fields. But I have a doctorate. And if I speak in tongues, people are going to think me mad. Don't worry about it, Karen. Speak in tongues. But God, this makes no sense. How can I pay this? Why are you telling me to pay this amount? You, you, you know what the circumstances look like. So the sea. Then what? That brings us to point number two. After you sow the seed, wait in faith. James chapter 5, verse 7 to 8 says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Hear this now. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains, you also be patient. Wait patiently. I can tell you that some seeds that I sowed five years ago, I'm still waiting for them. I am waiting with great expectation and with faith. And some seeds that I sowed last year are already reaping benefits. Think about it this way. A farmer has multiple crop lines. He may have what is called cash crops, callaloo, cabbage. Things that as you sow them within a short time, in a few weeks, they come to pass. You can reap and you sell them and, 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 and earn from them. But you also have some longer term crops that you have to be patient with. Sometimes you've got to be patient, so patient, because it seems that they take forever to come into fruition. Likewise with the seeds that you sow. Last week we spoke about naming your seed and assigning your seed to go and do things for you. But have multiple seeds, have multiple statements, have multiple requirements of the seed. So short-term seeds show long-term seeds. Short-term goals and long-term goals. And sometimes while you're even waiting, understand that the enemy is going to come and try to undermine what you are sowing. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Remember when Jesus tells the story? It was a parable of the weeds. A lot of us remember the parable of the seeds, but there was also a parable of the weeds where the man sows his field and goes to bed, and in the night, the enemy comes and sows among the man's field. And when this seed started coming up, the servant recognized that seed was coming up and giving a wheat. But something else was also coming up, and that was tears or weed. And the servant goes and says to the master, what is this? And he says, the enemy came in to sow. So the servant says, do we try to pull them out? But we may end up pulling up some of this, the wheat. And the master says, no, let them grow together until the day of harvest. Then you harvest, then you separate. So nothing is lost. Sometimes while you're sowing, some plans of the enemy will seem to arise on the job, in the church, 
even in your very home, wait patiently. Don't undermine the plan of the seed. Don't undermine the purpose of the seed and give up and drop hands. No. Water the seed with your prayers. And if you need to cry, water the seed with your tears. I remember there was a point in my life I was on a job that stressed me out. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. And I was sowing for my harvest. I was sowing my first fruit. I was saying, God, I don't understand. Move me, God. Show me a door. And God says, stay where I have put you. God says to Isaac, do not leave and go to Egypt. Stay where I have put you. Sow your seeds where I have placed you. And just wait by faith. Just wait. Because the rains will come one way or another. Whether it will come from heaven or it will come from underneath the earth, they will be watered. And I stayed in that job for a mighty long time. <laughs> And when the Lord finally removed me from the job, I left knowing that all the time I was there, I gave not 100%, but I gave 150% every day I went to work. And I'm going to lie, there were many days when I went and I cried in the car before going upstairs, wiping my face. There were many days my sisters cried with me and they were upset for me and they, they quarreled for me and they prayed for me and they interceded with God on my behalf. But there came the day of harvest. And let me tell you, the enemy who sought to undermine me they too had their reward. Because what you sow will be what you reap. That brings us to point number three. God appoints the time of harvest. Let me say that again. God appoints the time of the harvest. Turn with me in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24. So if you can't find it, think of it this way. Isaiah is round about the middle of the Old Testament and right after Isaiah is Jeremiah. So you're looking, you'll find Isaiah and Jeremiah and you're looking for chapter five, verse 24. I want you to underline this verse. That's why I'm going slowly and allowing you to find it because I want you to underline this verse. I want this verse to mark your steps in God. And we're going to start in the middle of the verse. Let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Some of us need to understand that what is set out by man as the normal expected time for harvest will not be that for you. Let me say that again. Some of us are planting not cash crops, but you're planting long-term crops. And it should take a long time. But let me tell you, God is expediting the time. God is going to speed up time so that the harvest comes in earlier than you can even think or imagine. He's going to give both former rain and latter rain and he will appoint the weeks of the harvest. Not at the time that it is supposed to be determined, but at the point when you least expect it. That widow who expected death did not expect a harvest. But when the man of God says, so into me, she did it. And she yielded a harvest 
that kept her until the end of the famine. One of my favorite scriptures is taken from John chapter 5, 35 to 38. And I know there are other scriptures that record this same passage, but I think I love John's version more. You see, the other scriptures tell us that, um, you know, uh, let, let's read John 5, 35 to 38, and you'll see where the comparative comes in. Say not ye that there are four months, then come at the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already with harvest. And he that reapeth, receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. Both he that soweth, and he that reapeth. May they rejoice together. Here it is saying, one sow it and another reaps. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestow no labor. Other men labor and ye are entered into their labors. It sounds a little confusing if you're not getting the perspective because you're using the King James Version. But I want you to look also at the NIV Version or the Amplified Version. What was happening was that Jesus was saying to the disciples, and in this case, he was speaking about the harvest of souls. And he was saying to them, look, usually we're saying that harvest will come in another four months and we have set seasons and time. We're waiting on Omricon to finish so that we can start the business. We're waiting on Omricon to finish so we can take a mortgage. We're waiting on Omricon to finish before we change the job. We are waiting on the logical. We're waiting on what man determines is the right season. But God says, look at the fields right now. It is ripe. Move now. And some of us are going to reap what we did so. And some of us are going to reap and so. And some of us are going to rejoice with the man who reaps and we who sowed. And some of us are going to be the one reaping and we will rejoice with the one who sold because it is entering in a season that is unbelievable and it's not logical because God is not contained by the logics of men. The fourth and final thing I want to point out tonight is the size of the harvest. The size of the harvest. We're talking about it is time for a harvest. And we say that the timing one it must be God's timing. And the only way you can hear God's timing is if you have a relationship with him. We say that after you sow, then comes the planting, comes the waiting. It's not logical, but you wait in faith. You wait patiently. We understand that sometimes during the waiting, there will come the enemy trying to steal your joy, trying to distract you with his plans, but stay focused, keep your faith in tune, have a spirit of expectancy. And then we say, God will appoint the time of harvest. And we say some of the things you sowed are going to be like cash crops coming in right away. And some of them are going to be long-term coming in at the long end. And then some of them that should be long are going to come quick. And now we're saying, God determines the size of the harvest. When we read Genesis 26, it says that Isaac sowed and reaped a hundredfold. Man, that's massive. It means that you sow one thing and you got a hundred things on top of the one for every one you sowed. That's massive. But can I tell you that the harvest we we'll reap will be in relation to our ability to steward it. If God can't trust you with little, how do you expect him to give you the much? If you're getting $10,000 on the job and you can't give God $1,000 out of it, you can't pay a first fruits out of it, then how do you expect God to move you into a job where you're going to earn $100,000 a month? 
The size of the harvest is directly related to our ability to steward what God gives us. Matthew 25, verse 15. Do you remember that scripture where Jesus tells the story of the three men with the talents? One had five, one had two, one had one. And it says an interesting thing in verse 15. It says, to each was given according to his ability. God knew that the one with the one would not have been able to manage the five. And the one with the two couldn't manage the five. And the one with the five can manage five and one. He knows our ability. He knows our heart. He knows our intent. He proves it because at the end of the story, the one with the five gained five. The one with the two gained two. But the one with the one went and buried it. Some of us have buried the abilities that God has put inside of us that was supposed to be the harvest seed. Because we're afraid of it. We prefer to go around and beg. We prefer to give out our hands and request arms. But God has given to us according to our ability to manage. And God will determine the size of the harvest. When the harvest comes, how will you manage it? In Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21, it tells us the story of the rich fool. It's actually called the parable of the rich fool. Jesus is teaching and somebody shouts from the crowd, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus says, who made me judge or arbitrator over you? Take care and guard against covetousness because you shouldn't get so caught up about the abundance of possessions. Not that you shouldn't have, he says, do not get caught up in the abundance of it. Because what you have been given is not just for you. We went into this last week. It is for the blessing of the entire earth. You notice what he said to Isaac? Through you, the entire earth will be blessed. Remember, he said the exact same thing to Abraham. Remember when Joseph went down to Egypt and the Pharaoh had the dream and Joseph got the interpretation and they started buying up all of the foods, all of the things during the period of glut, so that during the period of famine, they could be a blessing to the whole earth. Yes, they got rich during the portion of it, but the whole matter was, how do you stand as a steward? If Joseph had not been a good steward during the season, he would have lost everything. So here Jesus is telling the story about this rich fool who said to himself, I have so much I am, don't have anywhere to store my crops. I'm going to build, lick down the old barns, build, build bigger barns and store all my grains and all my food. And God said, yeah, so you're there talking about your soul will have things so many years and you're going to relax and drink and be merry. But tonight, you fool, your soul is required of you. It means that he was going to die. As a steward, if God gives you a massive supernatural harvest, is your reaction going to be, oh, I have enough to eat, drink, and be merry? Or will your reaction be, how can I use this, like the man with the five talents, to grow my master's kingdom, to build out more for my master? Is it any wonder when the master came back and found that the idiot who buried the one talent was there waiting to be subjected to some sort of authority because he says, I know you're not fair. I know you're a man who reaps where you don't sow and takes what is not yours. So the master says, yeah, well, that's what you're waiting on. Let me take it away from you. So as you reap, what you expect is what you're going to get. So I'm going to take it from you since you think I'm going to take it from you anyway. And he gave it to the one with five. I remember some years ago, I preached this message and my sister looked at me and she said to me, that, that's a younger sister. She said to me, so tell me, why didn't he give it to the one with two? Why give it to the one with five? Because no, God knows our capacity to manage. 
1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 7, Paul says, I plant, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. Trust God to determine the size of your harvest. Tonight, understand it's time for your harvest. So with an expectation to hear the voice of God. So with an expectation for God to tell you it is time. How much, where must I sow? So with the expectation that even though there is a famine going on, remember we're talking about sowing your first food, sowing your tithes, sowing you in the ministry. How do you give to the ministry with your time, with your, with your talents, with your gifts? How do you sow in your home? How do you sow by starting your own business? Tell God to tell you when, how, where. You don't need to know the why. That's for God because he will give the increase. My challenge tonight was simply tell you, be expectant because as you sow, you will reap. And guess what? It's time for the reaping. It's time for the harvest. I do hope that something from tonight's study connected with you and that you learned about even one important truth that will build your Christian faith and your Christian walk. Thank you so much for joining me one more time and let's study the word. I do hope that you will like, share, follow on Facebook where the messages are uploaded on a Monday. And until next week, may God bless and keep you in Jesus' name, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Love you. See you next week.